I am super excited today to have a guest that I think is as passionate about financial education as I am. Virginia Asher is joining us, and I love the name of her business, Wealthy Living. She is the founder, and wealthy is spelled, it's a combination of wealth and health. How smart is that? She is providing financial education and coaching services. She also continues her financial planning work for business owners and high net worth clients through a consulting firm or two. She has a bachelor's in uh, finance here. We're both in Phoenix. So she was at uh, ASU, Arizona State University, then went on to a master of science in advanced financial planning with a concentration of, on financial life planning. Love that. So we're both certified financial planners. But she is not only CFP in the United States, but also for Canada, Canadian residents. She has been a past president of the Financial Planning Association of Greater Phoenix and is still actively involved, especially on the financial literacy side of things, providing financial literacy education in a variety of capacities. And I'm so excited, Virginia, you got a much deserved award, the Financial Planning Association Heart of Planning Award last year. And um, you you well deserve that. So thank you so much for taking time to join me today. Thank you so much for having me. That was such an honor and surprise to get that award. <laughs> but um, I really enjoy the volunteer work I do. It's very similar to the coaching and education work that I do. Uh, and very dissimilar from the financial planning work I do. <laughs> <laughs> Well, in this country, I always say we don't do a bad job with financial education. We don't do the job at all for the most part. That is correct. Just that not a part correct. of the education system. And, you know, yep. in all of our opinion, it shouldn't be just early on. It should be throughout lifetime. So yes. those of us that are, are passionate about educating, whether we're working with someone on their personal finance or not, I think usually have something that has triggered us to do that kind of volunteering and education. So I'm curious, what led you to financial planning in general and then kind of the segue to more broad financial education and literacy? So I um, I grew up, in, I had a little bit of a rough childhood and I grew up hearing that I wouldn't graduate from high school. Mm. And I did, I have drawn a lot of motivation uh, from negativity that has been thrown at me. So um, I'm sure a lot of people can relate to that. Um, people that are supposed to care about you are not always the most supportive. And so when I graduated with uh, my high school diploma, I looked around and was like, okay, what am I supposed to do now? Well, I didn't know people going to college or anything. So I just, uh, and I had moved out of my dad's house. So I just started taking electives and ended up getting an associate's degree at a community college and then uh, transferring to ASU in the business college, but I didn't know what I was going to do. And then I got into a really serious car accident, fractured my back, was on my back for nine months, had to learn to re, I had to learn to walk again. Mm. And, um, and I got some money out of that um, a pretty significant amount for an early twenties person, uh, but not a lot in the big picture of things. And I looked around at the people I know in my life, my family, my friends at the time, and I didn't know anyone that knew anything about money. I knew people that were declaring bankruptcy or in debt or, you know, like, I just didn't know anyone to ask anything and I didn't know anything. And so I started going down that road, like, where, what am I going to do? And I got two really good pieces of advice from my attorney at the time. And I know we have this idea of attorneys just being terrible people. <laughs> <laughs> Lawyers, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, he said two really important things to me. Um, you know, that motivation uh, that comes up that negative motivation that I was talking about. He said, less than 5% of people who get a windfall have anything left mm -hmm. after five years. Mm -hmm. So, okay, now you just put the challenge down, right? <laughs> and then he said, this money is for 
your future health problems that you don't know you're going to have yet. Mm. And uh, for people that don't know that we, we all have biases. So one of the things that this did uh, that relates to the psychology of financial planning is it made this mental accounting bucket for me. Like this is for this thing. And so when people started asking me for money, because they all knew I got something, I could say no, because I, ha I have that clear boundary. This is for future me. This person isn't going to take care of future me. So now I have to figure out how to keep my money. So that's why I ended up with a degree in finance. Wow. Uh, at the time, financial planning wasn't a degree program. Hmm. Um, and interestingly, <laughs> a degree in finance does not teach you anything about financial planning. <laughs> it's all business finance, isn't it? <laughs> it is. Corporate. Um, it does teach accounting. you like the economic theories. But what I love about behavioral finance, I'm a big student of behavioral finance and the psychology of financial planning, is that basically economics is based on like this perfect person that's super rational, but that person doesn't exist. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's no one like that. So, yeah. <laughs> So yeah, uh, so that's how I ended up getting into financial planning is I wow. went to, I when I finished my degree, then I started looking around and I started at Vanguard. So I'm a Vanguardian. Mm -hmm. That's where I did my foundational education in the, in the profession. And I actually got my first certified financial planner designation while I was there. Um, and for anyone, like people always send people to me, young people who are thinking about going to work at Vanguard. And I always say that it's a great place to learn, but not a great place to earn. Sure. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, I mean, I learned so much there. And especially if you're willing to take lateral moves so that you can learn something new. Yeah. Uh, it's such a great place to learn. So I was, I learned customer service. They sent me to Disney training at the time. Uh, the Stephen Covey Franklin sure. uh, training yeah. on, you know, managing your time and productivity. Um, I worked in the IRA department when Roth IRAs came out. Mm. I worked in the small business department when um, solo 401ks came out mm. and Keo plans kind of went the way of the dinosaur. Mm. Uh, so, you know, I got all these really great foundational pieces for being a financial planner and I keep up on those things so I'm still a subject matter expert on some of this stuff and uh, then moved into um, I was kind of getting bored <laughs> of having the same conversations all day so I moved to a cross-border financial planning firm which was completely different and that's where I got my Canadian CFP Sure. We worked mostly with Canadians in the U.S. or Americans abroad and really interesting work, really complicated, something you should definitely not do by yourself. <laughs> you, It's a team effort, yeah. <laughs> but learn so much about taxes, uh, the tax code, tax treaties, like so much craziness. Um, so what your viewers might notice is that I love to learn. <laughs> And so good. I take a lot of opportunities for the learning aspect of them. Sure. Well, my gosh, it sounds like the the turning point was a good news, bad news, the whole accident and yes. the, the dollars that came with it. And it's interesting yes. that the attorney said what he did. I know a CPA that has had five lottery winners as clients, and she made sure that she shared the statistic with them that a majority of lottery winners have zero left after two years. And it's this huge variety of reasons, but friends and family come out of the woodwork is always one of them. And despite the fact that they had her as a CPA and she told them, this is a risk, they all lost their money. Yes. So it's, it's unfortunate. And I'm sure that as you've been in various aspects of personal finance, financial education, 
there's probably, well, I know we, we've seen it all, some common misunderstandings or myths that um, are really helpful to try to help set people straight so that they act differently, that behavior change, yeah. like you mentioned. So are there some more common ones that you've kind of run into on the myth side of things? Yes, um, definitely. There, uh, there's actually so, so many, yeah. so many of them. <laughs> and I think a lot of them come from a place of judgment. Uh, mm -hmm. The thing that people forget is finance is personal. That's why we call it personal finance. Right. <laughs> so there's not one right way to do things. I mean, unless it's literally the law. Right. If someone is telling you always or never, they're probably not giving you good advice. Good, good point. So, um, you know, it's it's human nature for us to be judgmental, but mm -hmm. you have to recognize it and try to mitigate it. So, for example, uh, you will hear that you shouldn't have any debt. Um, you need to have some debt to build your credit, and your credit score affects, in some cases, employment opportunities. Um, almost always affects your insurance rates, things like that. I'm not saying to, you know, pay a lot of interest and stuff, but there's smart ways to, to do this. And, uh, another one is you should only buy used cars. And, um, I typically, uh, I, I'm going to say typically because, you know, I don't want it to be like an all men kind of thing, but I do typically hear that from men rather than women, uh, because um, I was teaching uh, for Arizona Community Education, uh, Economic, mm -hmm. ACE, uh, I always forget what this stands for. Uh, they have a high school program on budgeting. And so I was teaching the transportation piece with a young guy and he wanted to go down that road of like, you would never buy this, you, new car that they have on here and I said listen because mm -hmm. he lives here in Phoenix and I said at the time I was living on the west side of town uh, and I was commuting 30 miles a day each way mm -hmm. on the I-10 which is a very busy freeway and typically commuting home in the dark mm -hmm. and I said as a woman who doesn't know a lot about fixing cars and can't do much anyway because of that, you know, back fusion. <laughs> um, I will pay the premium to have a reliable car instead of some, instead of just not knowing what I'm getting. Sure. Right. With a warranty and good mileage and yeah, all of yeah. that. Um, I had another example for him. Uh, I had a client who was in her eighties. You would have thought she was like 65 uh, and she said, you know, this is probably the last vehicle I'm going to buy. Sure. I said, you're buying brand new because you need all the safety features. Sure. Mm -hmm. Right. So it so, goes back to your whole point of personal finance is personal. So one answer yes. for one person can very much be different than another. All for yes. different reasons. Definitely. Definitely. Yes. Yeah. So, so. I, I know we you've been in this industry for years and... Do you feel like there's something on the financial literacy side that that you really discovered? You know, it's different than personal finance where it's one-on-one -on -one and yeah. individual money-making decisions. And financial literacy often is broader concepts with examples of what you might run into in your real life. Right, yeah, yeah. So I, um, I've done a lot of different programs um, through different groups, but one I was teaching um, that I started teaching in 2020, taught for a few years. Um, it was a 12, class, uh, 12 sessions for each class. And so you kind of got to see what was going on with your students in a lot of cases. And so one of the things that I noticed is that first of all, generally when men attended the classes, they were kind of looking to make sure they already knew, you know, they were looking for validation on what they knew. Um, or in some cases, even looking at getting into um, financial planning as a profession. Oh. Where the women were really looking to see what they didn't know. 
you know, that whole, like, I know what I know, but I don't know what I don't know. Right. <laughs> right? right. So they were in that quadrant. And, um, I was, uh, shocked is the only word that comes to mind, like flabbergasted. I had a student that, uh, came back, uh, you know, from the previous week and said, you know, I was talking to my dad, she was in her early twenties. I was talking to my dad about what we learned last week. And he said he knew that. So I asked him why he had never told me any of that information. And he told me that I didn't need to know that because my husband would take care of it. Mm, yikes. This was in 2022, people. This is two years ago. Like, this is not 1953. Right. <laughs> you thought it was generational, right. but maybe not, huh? Yeah, I was so I was so surprised. But you also have like these amazing moments where you see people have the uh they see the impact mm -hmm. of understanding their own finances. And so I had a student who uh we taught the insurance section and then uh then uh I think we were doing two classes a week at the time. So it wasn't the next class, but the next one after she came in and she said and this was all virtual. And she said, you are not going to believe this. Okay, <laughs> blow my mind. Uh, and she said that she realized from her class that her money beliefs came from her family. They thought insurance was a scam and you, pay for, you only pay for what you have to have. And so she went and changed it after we had the class to have better coverage that was appropriate for her. And she got in a car accident and said, I would not have had a way to go to school or to work if I had not been in that class wow. and made that decision. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that kind of impact is like, this is why I'm in the profession. <laughs> that's right. I was going to say, that's got to be one of the favorite things about what you do is that yes. aha moment and those examples of, oh my gosh, this really works. Yes. And I, I just, I love the aha moments when, when women, especially when they get that they actually know a lot more than they think they do. Yes. Um, it's, we're so, we're told that women aren't good at numbers. Women aren't good at math. Mm -hmm. You know what? I'm going to let you all <laughs> in on a secret. Men aren't born good at math either. Yeah. It's all practice. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> you have mm -hmm. to work at it. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, no, I think that's a great uh, reminder. And it is so much of what we grew up with that we have no control over what we grew up with, but at least becoming aware of that impact, I think is, is huge. Yeah. Over the years, do you, do you feel like there's kind of three areas or categories or just flat out do this or don't do this three things that our listeners could kind of take away to say, Oh, okay, I'm going to check. And am I doing that? Or am I not doing that? That yeah. could potentially make a big difference in their personal yeah. financial lives. Yeah. Um, so, you know, with behavioral finance being my, my thing, my passion, mm -hmm. uh, the first one I'm going to tell you, it's not something you go check in your, in your finances. It's something that I just want you to think about. I want you to say out loud, I love money. If that feels really uncomfortable to you, I want you to think about why. Because mm -hmm. money is a tool, right? And usually when I work with someone who is really uncomfortable with that idea, it's because they have ideas that they're not worth it. They're not deserving of it. Mm -hmm. uh, that if they have money and become rich, then people won't like them. Like these are, these are just things we've told ourselves. They're not true. Mm -hmm. uh, there will be, there are sometimes people that don't want you to, be rich, but, or, you know, to even to be able to take care of yourself, maybe those shouldn't be people in your life. Right. Um, I think it's helpful then, 
finish the sentence in your mind. I love money because of the things that helps me do in my life that I value. Yeah. Yeah. And whatever those things are, like yeah, name those it's a tool. specific things. Yeah, absolutely. It's just a tool. Yep. Yeah. Awesome. Um, uh, the second one I would say is uh, practice understanding your finances and schedule it. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, when we go through financial literacy classes, a lot of times we have think people do stuff for 30 days. It's it's not just a rote exercise. It's so you can start to develop a habit and see patterns. Mm -hmm. And then as you do it longer, you don't have to do it every day. You can do it less often. So, you know, I don't have to balance or reconcile my bank statements every day or every week. I can do it every month because I've been doing it for years. There you go. Uh, but... Uh, when, when I got divorced, I did, uh, I took a pay cut around the same time I ended up in debt and, uh, I wanted to pay it off, of course. <laughs> and so I made a plan and I literally every paycheck, I sat down and figured out how I was going to, what I needed to pay for the next month mm -hmm. and where those paychecks were going to fall. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, what, would be left that I could use to pay down that debt. Awesome. And, you know, that's, I love what you, what you say about don't let your honey, don't let your honey, don't uh, rely on your honey, don't for rely your on your honey for money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and a man is not you know? a plan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A man is not a plan. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I was with my ex-husband for almost 20 years. Yeah. I got married when I was three. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> I was just gonna say that. <laughs> but you know, even when I was with him, he didn't take care of the finances. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> mm -hmm. but I love your idea of scheduling and it's a matter of yeah routinely paying attention to it. And I always laugh when I hear this tip, which I totally agree with, but I met a couple that he literally sat her down quarterly with a PowerPoint slide presentation on their finances. <laughs> so I love that for you. That seems a little over the top for me, but that's me. <laughs> yeah. So and consistent. When, when I do work with couples, I generally tell them to have their money conversations somewhere outside their house. That's a great uh, If you ever uh, if you follow Ramit Sethi, he, he and his wife, they actually travel abroad once a year to have their money meetings Ooh, and plan their motivated. coming year. And they're both business owners. So it's like their business planning and their, mm. and their couples and Sorry. everything. Um, I've actually had, I had clients, um, that actually had that once a year they had, they would book a hotel room for a weekend and have a staycation awesome. and have all their money talks. Right. Yeah. Awesome. So it takes some of the pressure off. You don't want to have money talks when you're um, mad. Yeah. No, not in a good mood. So I love money because it's a tool. Yes. Practice your schedule, your finances. Yes. And your yes. third tip. Um, you know, women, um, women still ha are way behind men in terms of what they earn and where they are financially. And there's a lot of systemic reasons for that, as well as personal reasons for that. Women typically don't negotiate, um, and that starts you out a lower amount. Um, among other things, we have the pink tax and so many other reasons, but what you... But you can't, if you can't change the circumstance, you can change what you do about it. So I would advise to be curious and to always be ready to take an opportunity um, when it comes your way. When you put yourself out there and you tell other people, men or women, what you want to learn, what you want to do, who you want to serve, it feels scary, but people will help you make it happen. And they might not say something to you right then, but later on, they'll be thinking about it. And they'll think of something or they'll come across something and they'll say, oh, this would 
this would work for what you were telling me. Mm -hmm. So put yourself out there, even though it's scary. You know, people are not judging you as much as you think they are. Right. We're our hardest critic. And I mean, the time. if they if they are judging you, you know, just be yourself. That's right. Dear loss. Yeah. Well, I know before we got started, you you have um, so many ideas and so many resources yeah. and you sound like you're actually compiling a resource guide for people to yes. find what what most fits them because we all learn differently and use tools yeah. differently. So yeah. how do people find you and uh, tell us more about this resource guide? Yes, I'm really excited about it. I actually created a resource guide um, a couple of years ago for an event I did with a group called Positive Paths. And um, some of the uh, links are no longer valid, some of the um, stuff like that. So I'm just read, I'm, I'm actually in the process of redoing the whole thing. Um, some of the budgeting apps have been renamed or Sure. are no longer around. There's new ones that are better, uh, some different things like that. Um, I do have some uh, state links for free places you can get documents. And those links do change every time the attorney general changes. Mm -hmm. So there's some things like that. But uh, just by uh, kind of putting them all together, there's just different areas of your financial life that you should be paying attention to. So it kind of gives you like where you can start if you want to try to do it on your own. And then if you need a financial coach, you know me, you know Marie, we we love doing that. And I think everyone just finds who is a good fit for them. So my website is wealthyliving.info because I'm going to give you all the info uh, and it's wealthy with a WH because wealth and health affect each other. Yeah. So uh, you can also find me on Facebook. I have a Facebook group and Instagram and LinkedIn. Um, mm -hmm. I'm actually fairly uh, regularly on LinkedIn more than any of the others. I'm uh, doing a lot more posting on the others. And I do have several events coming up this year uh, on debt, estate planning, and budgeting uh, that will include other speakers. So you can get lots of perspectives for your own personal finance journey. That's awesome. That's helpful. Thank you so much, Virginia Asher. You had lots yes. to share. I loved your tips. We'll have everything in the show notes to make it easy for our listeners to follow up and take this wherever their next step takes them. So yes. thank you so much. And uh, till next Marie. time, listeners, we'll look forward to our next chat.